Hey, fifth graders, um, let's continue reading our land of stories. Um, this is the second book of the series. We finished the first one last semester. This one's called The Enchantress Returns. Um, I'm going to reread just a little bit to refresh our memories, but um, so I'll start with the end of chapter seven. And um, the twins, Alex and Connor, are in their house and they're having. Um, Mother Goose has been there watching them, and she's not quite what they expected. She's a little rougher than the um, stereotypical Mother Goose picture they had. And so um, Mother Goose has been sitting there drinking out of her thermos and telling stories and j making jokes, and she um, starts to talk about something that will lead us into Chapter 8. So I will start at the end of Chapter 7, Lucy Goosey. It's page 110 if you have it at home. Mother Goose tensed up as much as she could with all the bubbly in her system. I can't. I promised your grandmother that I wouldn't say a word, she said. Then don't say it. Rhyme it, Alex said. She stood up and looked closely into Mother Goose's eyes, more desperate for information than ever. I'm going to find out eventually. It's only a matter of time. So please just tell me, who is Esmia? Mother Goose looked around the house to make sure they were alone and took one final swig from her thermos. She looked away from Alex and into the fire, not wanting to make eye contact with Alex while she gave up the information she had sworn not to give. For years the world presumed she was dead, her whereabouts were unknown and left unsaid. In the shadows she stayed, quietly plotting, a vengeful wrath she planned on igniting. Driven by rage and centuries of sorrows, a suppressed fear shall soon be tomorrow's. After failing to curse a princess's death, she's now set her sights on the wor world's last breath. Happily ever after will be a thing of the past, for the evil enchantress has returned at last. Mother Goose closed her eyes, not from fatigue this time, but from shame. Alex had hung on to every word. The enchantress, Alex asked, putting together the pieces of her rhyme. The evil enchantress who tried killing Sleeping Beauty is back? Yes, Mother Goose said. Her name is Esmia, and she has your mother. Her chin fell on her chest, and she went into the deepest sleep Alex had ever seen. Her snores filled the silent house. Alex's eyes darted around the room. Her heart was racing. She had to catch her breath, because learning this information knocked the wind out of her. It was if as, as if Alex's brain had switched to autopilot. She immediately ran up the stairs and into her bedroom. She dumped all the school books and supplies out of her backpack and piled in as many clothes as she could fit. She threw a sweater over her head and put on her running shoes. Alex ran down the stairs and into the kitchen. She stocked all the food and the necessities she knew she'd need on that long trip. Knives, matches, water bottles. She wasn't even that careful passing by the soldiers who were passed out at the table. Even if she was caught making a run for it, she was so determined. She didn't think anyone or anything could stop her. She went out the front door and steered her bike off the porch and into the street. She glanced back at all the gnomes, and while they remained completely still, she knew the soldiers inside were anything but. I know you can't stop me because I'm not in any danger, Alex called out to the gnomes. Yet, she said under her breath. She pedaled off into the night as fast as she could, knowing it'd only be a matter of time before one of the soldiers or Mother Goose came after her. Alex didn't have much of a plan, but she knew where she was headed. She was going to her grandmother's cottage in the mountains. The trips her family used to take when she and her brother were small to visit their grandmother always took a couple of hours by car, so she knew she had a long journey ahead of her by bike. But if there was any place she could find something of her grandmother's to set off or turn on that gave her an entrance into the fairy tale, fairy tale world, she knew it would be there. Alex took one final look back at the, her house before it disappeared. A little voice inside her head told her it would be a long time before she saw it again, but she welcomed the feeling. She didn't care what her grandmother's wishes were. Alex was going to find a way into the land of stories and save her mom, even if she died trying. Now we'll start with Chapter 8, The Cottage. Alex woke up in a grassy field the next afternoon. She looked around and grunted to herself. She had been riding her bike all night and had just stopped to rest for a moment off the road. Clearly, that moment had lasted a few hours longer than she'd planned. She was in the foothills leading up to the mountains where her grandmother's cottage was. It had been a great while since the last time she and her brother had gone, so it was difficult remembering the exact directions. 
As the foothills slowly rose into mountain terrain, she stopped at a tiny gas station and purchased a map. Navigating became harder as the roads wound and forked up the mountains. She glanced back and forth at the map as she continued, making sure she was traveling northeast. She remembered her parents used to drive northeast until there were no more roads to take. Alex felt guilty for leaving her brother at home, but hadn't wanted to drag him into her spontaneous plan. Although, when night fell and Alex was forced to set up a small camp off the road by herself, she really wished her brother were there, keeping her company. She couldn't make up her mind if it was more dangerous to be traveling in the woods of a fairy tale world or her world. Even though there were no big bad wolves to be worried about, she was sure there were still regular wolves around. But if she couldn't handle a simple wolf now, how was she going to take down the powerful enchantress when she found her? She doubted swinging a big stick would uh, scare off the woman who'd cursed an entire kingdom for a hundred years. The more she thought about it, the less it made sense. Why did this Esmia woman want her mother anyway? How did she even get to her mom in the first place? If the fairies couldn't find her or her mother, what made Alex think she could? Alex and her brother knew more about the Enchantress than others gave them credit for. During their encounter with the Evil Queen, they discovered that the Enchantress had kidnapped the Evil Queen when she was a girl and used her in a scheme to take over the fairy tale world. Alex lay on the ground, using her backpack as a pillow, and let her troubled thoughts wander until she finally fell asleep. She was back on her bike before sunrise the next day. She biked across windy road after windy road until the middle of the afternoon. She jolted forward and almost fell off her bike when her, entire, when her front tire hit a particularly sharp rock and went flat. You've got to be kidding me, she said, and angrily tossed her useless bike to the side of the road. She would have to travel by foot for the rest of her journey, however long that may be. Her spirits rose an hour or so after, uh, afterwards when she saw a wooden bridge on the road ahead. When Alex and Connor were younger, seeing this bridge meant they were almost at their grandmother's house. She knew she was close. She jogged towards the bridge in relief, but the closer she got, the less familiar it appeared. It seemed so small uh, compared to the one in her memories. Was it just because she was so much smaller then? Also, disheartening how decrepit the bridge appeared to be. Every piece of wood was chipped and rotting like crazy. Alex took a couple steps onto the bridge and examined it closer. It didn't feel right. A car could never fit on the bridge. She looked over the side. Several hundred feet below was a dry and rocky riverbed. The bridge her family used to drive over it was only a few feet higher than the stream that ran under it. She sighed. She was lost. She turned on her heels and started to head back when she heard a sudden crack. Before she could tell where the sound was coming from, Alex fell straight through the bridge, rotten wood splitting under her feet. She screamed and grabbed hold of the bridge. She desperately tried pulling herself up, but it was no use. She could hear the wood cracking from the pressure. Help! Alex screamed. Somebody help me! Alex didn't know who she was yelling to. As far as she knew, she was alone in the mountains and she was about to fall to her death. No, 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 she says to herself. It can't end like this. It can't end like this. She struggled to pull herself up again. Another large, large, loud crack sounded, and she slipped further through the bridge and toward the rocky ground below. Alex felt two hands grab her as just in the nick of time. She looked up and saw a very familiar face looking down at her. At first she thought it was her dad, but then she realized it was Connor. A strange moment to notice how much he had grown up. Um, the, his face turned bright red as he struggled to hold his sister with all his might. Now, Lester, pull us up, buddy, he grunted. Connor and Alex were slowly dragged upward. Once Alex was above the bridge again, she could see Lester's bill tightly clutching Connor's pants, dragging him up while he dragged her. The giant goose pulled them across the bridge until they were safely on ground again. The twins and Lester stayed on the ground until they all caught their breath. I hate you so much right now, Connor said between heavy pants. That's funny, because I've never loved you more, Alex said with a big smile, and rolled over to give her brother a big hug. Thank you, I owe you. Luckily, with the amount of trouble we get ourselves into, I know you'll have the chance to make it up to me, he said. Lester squawked at them, as if to say, don't worry about me, I'm fine. She owes you one too, Lester, don't worry, Connor said. The twins stood up and brushed themselves off. They were covered in splinters and chips of rotting wood. Lester uh, got to his feet, too, and stretched out his neck and bill. How'd you know where I was? Alex asked. Lucky guess, Connor said. 
You can't even run away like a normal teenager. You're supposed to leave a note. There was uh, only one place I figured you were going. Lester and I had been flying around looking for you all day when we finally spotted your bike down the road. Does Mother Goose know where I am? Alex asked. I've been covering for you since I realized you were gone. I told Mother Goose you were sick and were vomiting all over your room. Then, when she wasn't looking, I hijacked her goose and came looking for you. How'd you manage that? Well, apparently he feels taken for granted and uh, thought by helping me it would teach Mother Goose a lesson, Connor said. I don't speak goose or anything, but I'm guessing that's the gist of it. Right, boy? Connor turned to Lester and the giant goose nodded. Why didn't you take me with you? He asked angrily. How could you leave me locked up at home? Are you trying to do things solo now or something? Not cool, Alex. Alex lowered her head shamefully. Because Grandma's going to be mad at me when she finds out I took off, and I didn't want to drag you into it, she said. And I found out who has Mom. I pried it out of Mother Goose. So that's what uh, that's why you took off so abruptly, Connor said. Well, who has her? What did you learn? Alex now understood why her grandmother had kept uh, information from them. She felt horrible knowing that she was about to make her brother as stressed as she was. Apparently the Enchantress is back, Alex told him. The Enchantress, who cursed Sleeping Beauty, is terrorizing the fairy tale world again, and she has Mom. What? he said in disbelief. What does the Enchantress want with Mom? I don't know, Alex said. I've been trying to figure it out, and I can't think of anything. Well, I thought the Enchantress was dead, Connor said. The evil queen told us that she poisoned her, and she ran off and died. Remember? I guess she was wrong, Alex said. Esme is her name, and she's very much alive. And that's why we haven't seen Grandma in so long, Connor said. I suppose. Connor paced around the mountain road, thinking. We've got to get into that fairy tale world, Connor said. We have to save Mom. I agree, but what are we going to do when we can't, when we get there? We, uh, what can we do to save her that the fairies can't? Alex asked. We may not be able to do anything, Connor said, but two more people trying couldn't hurt. Besides, it sure beats sitting around and waiting for bad news. A small smile appeared on Alex's face. She couldn't have agreed more. Let's try to get Grandma's cottage before sundown, Alex said. Do you know where we are? Are we even close? Connor looked around at the mountains surrounding them. Yeah, we're close, he said, and then he pointed to a flat mountain peak in the distance. Grandma's cottage is just on the other side of that mountain peak. I remember it when we were little. I hoped it was a volcano. Are you sure? Alex asked. Positive, Connor said. Let's go. Lester, can you take us in the direction of that mountain peak? Lester cocked his head in the direction Connor pointed, let out an exaggerated sigh, and then nodded. Connor climbed onto Lester's back, then offered his hand to Alex. Climb aboard, he said. She hesitated. Are you sure this is safe? she asked. Lester squawked, rather insulted. You've got to try this, Alex. I understand why uh, OMG travels this way. OMG, Alex asked. Old Mother Goose, Connor said. It's my nickname for her. She calls me Sea Dog. Alex shrugged and took his hand. She swung a leg over the large goose and held tightly to her brother's waist. Connor gripped the reins, ready for liftoff. Let's fly, Lester, he said. Lester spread his wings. His wingspan was much more impressive in the daylight. He took a few steps back and then bolted into a fast waddle forward, flapping his wings as he went, and they rose higher and higher into the air. Connor was right. It was an incredible experience. The mountains seemed much more uh, majestic from the bird's perspective. The twins had never felt so free in their lives. I hope no one sees us, Alex said, fearfully looking down. I just hope it isn't goose hunting season, Connor said. Lester squawked and looked back at him, terrified. I'm just kidding, Lester. Relax. Um, Lester headed in the direction of the peak. A few moments later, they were flying over it. Connor was a little disappointed to see uh, it was, in fact, a flat mat mountaintop, and there was no sign of molten lava inside it. Keep an eye out for the cottage, he told his sister. It should be coming up any moment now. Alex scanned the ground below. It was hard to see anything but treetops and the occasional chimney. She saw a familiar bridge, and her eyes followed the winding road that crossed over it, through the woods ahead. At the very end of the road, she could make out the roof of a storybook cottage. I see it! I see it! She pointed to it. It's Grandma's cottage! Lester landed in front of the cottage just as the sun began setting. They climbed off the goose and observed their grandmother's old home. Whoa, it's definitely not in the same condition we left it in. It was obvious that no one had lived in the cottage for a long time. 
The front lawn was partially dead and overgrown in some places. The flower beds were full of weeds, and blades of grass were almost as tall as the twins. Ivy grew up um, the sides of the cottage, and part of the roof had caved in. Their grandmother's blue car was parked outside, but hadn't been driven in years. A layer of dirt covered it, and a city of spiderwebs had been spun between the tires. Although the cottage was used mostly as a prop, since their grandmother only lived here when the twins visited, it still was the location of the twins' happiest childhood memories. They were sad to see how abandoned it was. Alex and Connor approached the front, front door apprehensively. Lester, bon appetit, Connor said, and gestured over to the o gestured to the overgrown grass. Lester squawked and happily went to town on it. Do you think it's locked? Connor twisted the handle and the doors creaked open, answering her question. The twins stepped inside and surveyed the interior. It was exactly how they remembered it, except dusty and covered in cobwebs. Grandma's rocking chair was still by the fireplace and faced a large rug the twins used to lie on when she read to them. It's so strange to see everything again, um, Alex said. Grandma's chair, the fireplace, the kitchen table. I almost can't believe it um, that it's been here this whole time. Do you remember the forts we used to build with Dad under that thing? Connor asked, pointing to the table. Oh, how could I forget? You always tried keeping me out, but Dad never let you. You know it's funny, Connor said as he walked around. Even though we know, we know now that Grandma never actually lived here, whenever I picture Grandma, I always imagine her in this place, baking cookies, reading by the fireplace. Me too, Alex said. Most of our childhood was a front, but it was a happy front. You think we'll find something that can take us to the fairy tale world in here? We have to, uh, Alex said, but she had her doubts. She wasn't sure what she was looking for, but she knew she'd know it as soon as she saw it. Connor looked um, at all the dusty frames on top of the fireplace mantel. They were mostly pictures of him and his sister at birthday parties and holidays with their family. In one picture, the twins were three years old and sitting on Santa's lap. Connor was very chubby and had a big grin on his face. Alex was crying hysterically. Check out this picture of us with Santa, Connor laughed. You look like he's about to eat you. I was preparing myself for the other fictional characters that did try to eat us, Alex said. Connor snickered and picked up uh, another photo. No way! Look how young Mom and Dad look in this photo. I don't think we were even born yet. Alex walked and uh, looked at it for herself. Connor, we look just like them, she said. There's no denying that they're our parents. You're right, Connor said. I came up with the whole adoption theory when I found out we were part uh, fairy, but looking at this th looking at this picture kind of tosses that out the window. Alex went back to searching, confident something would pop up at any moment. Have you found anything that seems portal-worthy? Connor asked her. Not yet. Well, maybe except this? Alex was staring at a beautiful painting on the wall. She remembered it from when she was little, and unlike the rest of the cottage, the painting had remained just as vibrant. It was a watercolor painting of a pond, and it had beautiful shades of greens and blues. There was something about it that seemed more familiar now, as if they had been there. You think the painting could take us into the land of stories? Connor asked. It worked in one of the Narnia books. She stepped closer to the painting and placed a hand on its frame. It's the ugly duckling pond, Alex said, recognizing it. That's it. That has to be our way in. Why else would Grandma hang a picture of a pond in her cottage? You think you can get it to work, Connor said? I can try. She placed both of her hands on the golden frame and tried to will it to life. Nothing happened. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath, willing it even harder. Still, nothing happened. Connor clapped his hands loudly, breaking his sister's concentration. Clap on, he said. What are you doing? Alex asked him. Just thinking of other ways to turn it on, he said. Is there a remote control or an on switch somewhere? Maybe it's like a plasma screen. She ignored him and went back to focusing. She imagined all the other places and people she had met during her first visit. She imagined all the castles and forests she and her brother had seen. She imagined all the dangerous animals and creatures they had encountered. But mostly, she thought of how desperately she wanted to see them again. She thought of her grandmother, her father, and her mother. She thought of the pond and the painting, the lily pads, the fireflies, and of its water. To the twins' amazement, the painting began to glow. You did it! He hugged his sister. You set it off! I did? Alex asked. It was almost too good to be true. I did it! I did it! The twins jumped up and down with excitement, but their excitement quickly faded into fear. The painting began to glow brighter and brighter, and the cottage began to rattle. 
It felt like a large train was passing directly below them. Exactly how did the Narnia kids travel through the painting? Connor asked, slow, uh, stepping slowly away from theirs. Uh-oh. The cottage stopped shaking and the painting dimmed. Only now the painted pond was gone. The canvas was completely blank. Huh? That's strange. A bit of a relief, though, Connor said. I was worried for a second that water was going to spill out of the... Crash! The tidal wave of water crashed through the windows by the front door. The twins screamed and ran to the back of the cottage. Crash! Another tidal wave came rushing in towards the back. Water was gushing through every door and window and flooding the cottage. What is going on? Connor yelled. Did we hit an iceberg? He described it perfectly. They felt like they were sinking and sinking fast. They were already waist deep in water. The twins looked around in horror as their grandmother's former home was destroyed. What have we done? Oh, I've always wanted a pool, but this is ridiculous, Connor yelled. The water poured into the house faster and faster. The twins couldn't keep their feet on the floor anymore. They treaded water as it lifted them toward the ceiling. We've got to swim out of here or we'll drown, Connor said. Follow me. He took a deep breath and dove underwater. Alex was quick to follow him. They swam across the cottage to the front door. There was an extremely strong current coming through the door, so the twins had to grab hold of anything they could to force themselves against it. They pulled themselves past the front door and discovered the cottage was no longer in the mountains, but in a large, murky body of water. It sank below them and disappeared into the dark, watery depths. The twins grabbed hold of each other and swam as hard as they could to the surface, praying there would be a surface. Finally, they saw a distorted night sky above them. It was the surface. The twins surfaced in the mysterious water, gasping for air. The air was freezing against their faces. What was that all about? He yelled. Alex wasn't paying attention to him. She saw large trees in the distance with giant roots that sank into the ground. Fireflies filled the air and lily pads floated on the water around them. She knew exactly where they were. Connor, Alex said and excitedly splashed her brother. We're in the ugly duckling pond. We're here. We're back in the land of stories. Dun, dun, dun. Coming up next will be chapter nine. See you then.